Thank you, Eva, for those kind words. And thank you guys for coming in the rain. I'm impressed. Uh, uh, you know, since I'm a historian, let me start with a story that frames this. Early in my career at the Smithsonian, I was asked to curate an exhibition on the 19th century. And one of the stories I wanted to tell was the story of slavery. But I didn't want to just do a broad subject. I said, let's focus on one plantation. So I traveled all around the country looking at plantations. I looked at amazing cotton plantations in Alabama, tobacco plantations in North Carolina, interesting sugar plantations in Louisiana. And then I was taken to a rice plantation outside of Georgetown, South Carolina the old Waccamaw Neck. And as I went past the swamps, suddenly I came upon a street and it had six cabins still extant from the 1840s. But standing next to one of the cabins was a man who was 93 years old. His name was Princey Jenkins. Princey Jenkins had lived in that cabin with his enslaved grandmother. So therefore, you could imagine for a historian, this is the Holy Grail to have somebody talk to you about what it was like to be enslaved in this particular cabin. And Princey was wonderful. He took me to the front of the cabin and he talked about how his grandmother used a broom to do a hard sweep so that it would get rid of the grass, so there'd be no vermin, and that they could extend their living spaces. Then he took me to the side and said, talked about how children watch the chimney so it wouldn't catch fire or fall. Then he took me to the back and he talked for 20 minutes about the crops that his grandmother grew to supplement the food they were given. And then we went to the fourth side, or rather I went to the fourth side, he didn't come. And I said to him, um, Mr. Jenkins, what happened over here? He said, son, I'm not going over there. Now I'm a young scholar thinking, boy, I'm gonna discover something really amazing. And I kept saying, Mr. Jenkins, please come over here. And he said, son, there's no way. Finally, I said, why not? And he said, because there's nothing but rattlesnakes over there. <laughs> now, after I stopped running, uh, I said to him, why didn't you tell me? And he said, you know, people used to remember, now they forget. I'm not sure what a historian does, but your job ought to be to help people remember not just what they want to remember, but what they need to remember. And in some ways, the struggle to help America remember what it needs to remember about the African-American experience has gone back over 100 years. For me, what's so amazing is that the legacy of this museum that we opened last year really can be pointed to 1915 because it's shortly after the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg and there are all those wonderful images of old Yankees and old rebels shaking hands but no black people. And so African Americans began to demand a site, a monument on the mall. And they actually began to raise money, but then unfortunately, the war breaks out, World War I, no museum. Then the idea really gets picked up by Calvin Coolidge in the late 1920s. They not only pass legislation, but they put some money together to hire an architect to draw a building. But then the Great Depression occurs, and there's nothing. Ultimately, this idea lays fallow through the 60s and 70s. And then in the 80s, Mickey Leland and John Lewis begin to introduce legislation every year. And every year, it's knocked down. Even in the 90s, when they thought they might get it passed, a senator who loved the African-American, uh, Jesse Helms, um, basically killed the idea for this museum. But in some ways, the museum was successful for really two reasons. In 2003, legislation was passed and signed by George W. Bush. And it was signed and passed because for the first time, this wasn't an, uh, done by one party. That it wasn't a Democratic or Republican, but that really John Lewis's brilliance was able to put together an array of people um, who could stand on both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican, and pass this legislation. And in some ways, in 2005, I came back. And I have to tell you, we started this museum with a staff of two. 
We had no idea where the building would be. We had no collections whatsoever. We had no architect. We had no money. No, no, my youngest daughter gave me $7.35 to start the process. But other than that, we had no money. And what really was the key was figuring out how do you fulfill the dreams of many generations? For us, that was tied to creating a vision a vision that really made this museum happen. And part of that vision was simple. How do you create a museum that helps America remember? Remember the rich history of the African American, but also remember in an unvarnished way that would allow America to confront its tortured racial past. But it also had to be a place that while you cried as you pondered the pain of slavery or segregation, you also had to be a place you could tap your toes to Louis Armstrong or Aretha Franklin or somebody from the hip-hop world. I have no idea who it was, but, you know, that you could do that. But in some ways, if the museum just remembered, then I would argue it failed. That in some ways, the strength of the museum was to recognize that the African-American experience was the quintessential American experience. That when you want to understand core American values of optimism, resiliency, spirituality, where better to look than within this community? So for us, taking the African American experience and using it as a lens to understand what it meant to be an American, in other words, claim your Americanness, was really essential to the success of this museum. But then the other piece was it had to be a place of collaboration. If other museums of its type who did this kind of work didn't benefit, then it failed. But also for us, it was crucial to craft a museum that understood that this was an international story, that this wasn't simply a story within the confines of America, that the African-American experience was shaped by the diaspora, and in turn, it shaped the rest of the world. And that really came to me on a trip to Lapland in Sweden. I was in the middle of nowhere, and I was sitting under a reindeer tent with the village elder. And he said to me through the interpreter, are you an American? I said, yeah. He said, do you know Al Green? <laughs> now, Al Green the musician, I'm sitting there in the middle of nowhere and this guy's asking me about Al Green. And it reminded me the power of African American culture. If Al Green was somebody that the tribal chieftain knew about, now, I must be honest, when I came back and I said to Al Green, the tribal chieftain knew all about you, Al Green said, of course they know about me, but that's Al Green. <laughs> so in some ways, when we began this in 2005, we didn't have any idea of all the challenges that would face us. One of the first challenges was really thinking about intellectually and conceptually, what should a national museum be in the 21st century? How do you craft an institution that really helps America confront truthfully not only its tortured racial past, but its culpability? After all, as Americans, we're used to being the good men and women, right? And so to begin to help people say, how do you understand the fullness of this story was a real interesting conceptual challenge. But also, just asking questions like, What's the role of a national museum in a transnational age? Uh, what's the role of the diaspora? What, what does Africa mean in a museum called the African-American experience? So in some ways, we had to wrestle dramatically with, could you really create a museum that mattered, that could be of value, that could challenge America, but that ultimately might help America find reconciliation and healing? Wrestling with these really was something that was so difficult, but thank goodness in the early years, we had the work of John Hope Franklin, and he put together scholars from around the country who really helped us think about what this museum can be. But I'll tell you, the other real challenge going in was really the question of how do you deal with Congress? Many of you may remember the Smithsonian periodically runs afoul of Congress, uh, the Enola Gay and other things. And so the question was, how do you work effectively with Congress? Well, I remember early on in my tenure, um, the Smithsonian said I had to go meet a member of Congress who was key to the appropriations. And they said, however, 
want you to know this guy is not going to like you. So, like, get ready for that. So I'm thinking, great. So the day before I'm to meet this member of Congress, I go to a reception at the Library of Congress, and he's there. And he's a congressman from North Carolina, so I tell him my mother's from North Carolina. We're, you know, we're laughing, we're having a great time, and I figure, oh, this isn't going to be hard. Piece of cake. Well, the next day I walk into his office, and first of all, he's got 15 members of his staff standing against the wall waiting for me. And then he's got one of those desks where he's up here and you're down here. Um, and so I say, well, Congressman, it was really great to, and he cuts me off. He says, listen, I do not think the Smithsonian should build this museum. I'm not even sure I like the Smithsonian, but I know I don't like you if you're going to try to build this museum. And then he kept saying, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you $25,000, make it a website, and go away. And he kept saying that. And I'm sitting there going, Man, what am I doing? And finally, he took a breath. And I said, well, you know, um, a website isn't enough. I was at the Museum of American History for many years. And I collected the Greensboro lunch counter. And I've seen how people react to that and react to the Star Spangled Banner. Well, suddenly, this member of Congress starts to shake. He gets red. He puts his hand to his throat. And he starts to cry. And his staff hustles me out because I'm thinking, he's having a heart attack. My career is over. Bunch kills member of Congress. Um, so I'm thinking, this is not going to work. Can I still get my job back in Chicago? And so I'm sitting there waiting. And he comes out. And he says, you reminded me that during the Greensboro sit-in, lunch counter sit-ins, I was a student at Wake Forest. And I raised money to bail people out. He put his arm around me. He said, I like you. I'm not giving you any money, but I like you. Now, the good news is he lost his reelection bid, so don't mess with the Smithsonian. <laughs> One of the challenges was really trying to figure out where this museum should be. Traditionally, when Congress tells the Smithsonian to build a museum, they say, put it here. In this case, they gave the Smithsonian four different choices. Um, two off the mall, one in an old building, and one of the spots that you can see next to the Washington Monument. And there's some real feeling that the that this Congress should have just said, here's your spot. But instead, we had to spend a year analyzing the spots, making arguments, and, and fortunately for us, the Smithsonian, with its regions and congressional regions, recognized that this museum had to be on the National Mall. And so we were so fortunate to get this space. But it really happened is as soon as we got the space, suddenly it opened up all these questions. There were all these people who wanted to talk about what should this museum be? What's the public perception? I would receive letters from people saying, this museum has to be a Holocaust museum. It has to tell the story of what they did to us. I had other African Americans who would pull me aside and they would say, whatever you do, don't talk about slavery. Talk about positive images. You have a chance to reinforce the notions of new generations of students. But also, we got a lot of letters from people who didn't want the museum to exist at all. One of my favorites began, Dear Left Wing Historian. Even I knew that wasn't a fan letter. Um, and it went on to say, though, in a very serious tone, it said, what happened to the Smithsonian I loved? It used to be a place that celebrated America. It was a place that helped the world understand our greatness. And now you're going to build a museum that's going to talk about things that are better left unsaid. Um, and then they said a line that I've never forgotten. The line in the letter said, don't you know that America's greatest strength is its ability to forget? He then went on to say that, you know, people like me shouldn't be hired, you shouldn't build this building, but I must admit it threw me off because he signed it, best wishes for your continued success. <laughs> but it struck me that the real challenge was going to be, how do we find the right tension between what we as scholars wanted this museum to do, what the public wanted, and what even those who didn't want the museum. So we had to take that into consideration and really try to figure out, OK, how do we make this real? Well, part of it was the strategy that was so crucial to the success of the museum was the notion that 
since this idea had been floating around since 1915, how do you make people believe? How do you make this real? And the idea came really from a, uh, I, I was chastised by Mayor Daley when I left Chicago to come back. He called me into his office and he said, you know, first of all, why would you leave the great city of Chicago to go to a one horse company town called Washington? And then he said, and you know, why would you want to run a project? And that was so helpful. As I was leaving his office, I thought, that's the key, that this can't be a project. We have to make the museum exist from the day I got here. So what we did is we actually got exhibits that traveled around the country, whether it was exhibits on the Apollo Theater or exhibits on slavery, and we decided that we would not only do exhibits and educational and public programs, but we'd actually birth the museum online first. So the museum was born digitally. And all of that allowed us to sort of make an argument when people would say to me, come back when you're open. I'd say, we're already open. We just don't have a building. And that was so crucial in terms of the fundraising strategy, in terms of working with Congress. So the notion of Mayor Daley beating me up was so helpful to making this a successful museum. So I called him and I said, hey, anytime you want to beat me up, go ahead, because you got good ideas. And he said, when do you come back to Chicago? And I said, no, 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 no. And one of the things that really made this key for us is that early on, I was at a school in Washington, and this person, this kid came up to me, and he said, will a museum help me understand who I am? So for me, the notion of how is this museum an educational entity that helps not just this kid, but helps all Americans find out who they are, remember who they are, learn how they're shaped in profound ways by the African American experience was so crucial to the success of this museum. The other challenge, as Eva mentioned, was really building collections. Imagine, you've got a museum and you've got nothing. So the initial thought for many people was, well, don't worry about it. Use technology. Make it driven by technology. And my notion was, no, that's not good enough. At the Smithsonian, you've got to have artifacts. You've got to have the right flyer, the ruby slipper, the Greensboro lunch counter. So the notion was, how do we find this stuff? Well, I remembered early in my career collecting in California, and a woman said to me, I don't have anything, but go look in the basement. And she had a treasure trove of stuff. So I realized that so much of African American history is still in basements, trunks, and attics. So we created the notion, we stole it from Antique Roadshow. You know, we went around the country, bring out your stuff, we'll help you preserve grandma's old shawl. But the bottom line was, as people brought things out, first of all, they convinced us that there was material that we could collect. Secondly, people wanted to give this material to the Smithsonian. We often said, give it to the local museums first. But if it was really cool, it came back to DC. Um, and we collected over 50,000 artifacts, of which 70% came out of basements, trunks, and attics. So it really was the real reason for our success. Now, the hardest decision was, who do you hire as an architect? Um, you know, there were so interesting questions of race that shaped this. What does a building look like? Um, what does a building that says African American, what does that look like? Do you have to hire an African American architect? What's the role of other people in this process? So we literally did an international design competition with sort of 80 firms and got six down to give us models. And we ended up hiring David Adjay from the UK as the lead architect and Phil Freelon. And what was so interesting was that the challenge of figuring out what the building could be was really, I think, the most important challenge. And I wanna, I wanna come back to that and talk more about that. In 2012, we got President Obama to break ground, and the thing we did, and Eva, you may remember this, that we didn't have all the money, 
and there was a question of can you get the money from Congress. So as soon as we um, broke ground, what I did is I had the construction people dig a hole next to the Washington Monument because I figured Congress wouldn't let a hole sit next to the Washington Monument. Luckily, they was right. Otherwise, I was going back to Chicago real quickly. And so we began to build this building, began to construct it, began to put artifacts in it, and that in essence it opened, as you know, a year ago. And it was really one of the most amazing moments to really open a museum. You may remember President Bush and President Obama. There's a famous picture of Michelle Obama hugging President Bush. But what I remember most about that was looking around at thousands of people on the mall and realizing this is America at its best. This is an America that brings together diverse folks politically, racially, ethnically, and builds something they think is important. So for me, that was the day that restored my faith in what this country could do. But also, I think that the real challenge was this building. Obviously, if you've seen it, the building looks like nothing in Washington. And that was a conscious decision. When we got together to do the building, I said, I wanted a building that, first of all, was the first lead gold building on the mall. That was really important to me. Secondly, I wanted a building that spoke of uplift, resiliency, and spirituality. But thirdly, I wanted a building that was made of bronze because I wanted to remind America that there has always been a dark presence in America that often got undervalued or overlooked. And so this building was, in a way, to remind us of the diversity of this country. And you could imagine, oh, let's just say there are 17 regulatory agencies you have to deal with. You could just imagine the excitement or less excitement that, I, that when we brought this forward. But the thing that really made this work for me was the fact that this was going to be a building that reminded us as Americans that as long as there's an America, this story would be on the mall to be able to be told and be able to share, be shared. And I love the fact that it was in juxtaposition of, with the Washington Monument and the Capitol and the like, that it was the place where the story needed to be. But I think the part that really made the building special for me was this corona. We call it the corona. And what this is, is that this was going to be a solid bronze building. And the architects realized that you can't have solid bronze. You've got to be able to punch holes in it. So they were going to do some geometric figures based on the computer. And I thought that was the wrong idea. So what I did is I went down to Charleston and New Orleans, took pictures of all that ironwork that the enslaved craftspeople did. And that's what's over the entire building. So the building is a homage to the fact that so much of our history, so much of America's history, has been built and shaped by people whose names we'll never know. So this is our way to thank them and to acknowledge them. Um, plus, it's awfully pretty. And I love the fact that as you look at it at different lights, it shines differently. Um, but I have to tell you, when we first started looking at this architecturally, Architects sent me all kinds of models. And one of the models they sent was the museum in the shape of a black power fist. Now, I got to be honest, I can get many things through Congress, but I wasn't <laughs> sure I could do that. So, whenever the regulatory agency said, Well, we're not sure we like this building, I'd say, You like a black power fist? They began to love this building. And so, one of the things that's beautiful to me is that this building also does something that no other building on the mall does. Every time you're in a building on the mall, you're in the building. This is a building about vistas. It gives you views because I want people to realize the mall itself is sacred space for African Americans. And so I want you to be able to explore an exhibition that looks at the March on Washington and then look out and see the Lincoln Memorial. So the notion of making this part of the landscape was really crucial to the success of building this museum. And then the other thing we did is there's a lot of water. You cross water to get into the building. There are 
spaces that we call the contemplative court that gives you a chance to decompress after wrestling with so many difficult things. But we wanted the building to be full of surprise, to be full of beauty, but to also challenge, but also inspire. But as I said earlier, building collections, boy, that was the challenge. And some of the stories of things we had were just so moving to me. I mean, I was really struck. This is our very first artifact. This is given to me by an Afro-Ecuadorian who, during the first couple of weeks when I was working, I was commuting to Chicago. So I would be working really late. And one night, this guy came at 9.30 and said, I've got an artifact for you. And it turned out his community fled into the swamps. So the mode of transportation were canoes. And the role of the sort of senior women were to carve canoe seats. So he gave me this canoe seat carved by his grandmother with the Anansi spider. So to think about a West African connection from Ecuador that went into the museum became the first artifact in our collection and reminded us every day to frame this through an international lens. But my favorite artifact that was most memorable was this collection, which included the, the um, shawl of Harriet Tubman. Now, many of you know Charles Bloxon, the great collector. So Charles Bloxon called me one day and he said, Lonnie, I've got material of Harriet Tubman. And I told him, I said, you're crazy. I'm a 19th century historian. There's nothing of Harriet Tubman. Um, and he said, well, look, why don't you come to Philadelphia and I'll prove it to you. And I thought, well, you know, at least I get a cheesesteak out of the deal. So I figured I'd go to Philly, and I go there, and he pulls out a box, and he reaches in, and he pulls out pictures of Harriet Tubman's funeral that no one had ever seen. And whenever I would get excited, Charles Bloxon is a really big guy, and whenever I'd get excited, he would get excited, and he would punch me. And it hurt. And so he pulled out 33 items, and every time he did it, he punched me. Finally, we get to this shawl. This shawl was given to Harriet Tubman by Queen Victoria. And there's a famous picture of her wrapped in the shawl three days before she died. Well, I'm crying. But I don't know if I'm crying from the pain or the beauty. <laughs> but what struck me is I'm sitting there talking to him, and I realize, boy, he's going to ask for money or something. We can't afford this. And Charles Bloxon, I said, OK, how much? And he said, it is yours to share with the American people. And what has moved me most about our collecting is so many people did just that. Opened up their basements, trunks, and attics, but said, this is yours. So I'll never forget Charlie Bloxon, partly because my arm still hurts, um, but it was just an amazing gesture. Or people like this. This is a dress from Carlotta Walls, who was one of the Little Rock Nine. And when she was going to desegregate Central High School, her parents didn't have much money, but they wanted her to look good. So they saved their money and bought this dress. And if you look carefully, it's got the alphabet all over it. And so there's a famous picture of her, you know, confronting the people yelling at her in that dress. And the notion that people would keep these things and then share them with us was really powerful to me. The object that makes me cry, though, more than anything else is this. There was a man named Joseph Trammell who gained his freedom in the 1850s, and he basically was given his freedom paper. And he was terrified that he would lose that paper, would get damaged by perspiration when he was working. So he made what he called a handmade tin wallet, and he put that paper in it, and he'd carry it with him every day. And then every night, he would take it out and he would have the family gather around and they talk about freedom, the power of freedom, the meaning of freedom. And the family kept this for five generations and then gave it to the Smithsonian. It's that kind of generosity that has really made this museum successful. Or things like this. Many of us have seen those pictures of Marian Anderson when she sang on Easter morning um, in 1939. Well, it's all black and white. So you could almost think that maybe she was a little nervous, a little coward by this, but this is the dress she wore. She was a diva. Um, and so I love the notion how an artifact can change our understanding of an object, of a moment like Marian Anderson's. And I could go on and on. 
you know, Benjamin Banneker's almanac was something somebody gave us. A family by the name of uh, Charlton had lost a, a son in Korea in 1951, and all they had of him was his Congressional Medal of Honor. But they wanted the museum to have that. For people to share that kind of thing just meant so much to us. And then we found things like this, small things that were so powerful. These are buttons and the initial TP. Thomas Porter was one of the largest slave traders um, in the antebellum period. And in some way, his product was considered <gasps> superior. So what he would do when he would take enslaved people to be sold, he would put these buttons on them. And if you saw a button with TP, you knew that was a quality individual. And to actually have that, and to be able to, we actually found this in a trunk in South Carolina. To be able to tell those stories because people preserve things that were important to them really allowed us to tell our story. Or this, these are shards of glass from the 16th Street Baptist Church when it was bombed in 1963. Collected by family members, kept for generations, and then given to the museum. Or this is another example of my lack of wisdom. This is Nat Turner's Bible. I was told by an archaeologist that there was Nat Turner material, and I said, nope. And I put him off for six months. Finally, we went down to Southampton County. Didn't see much, but I went on the radio, said I'd love to have Nat Turner material. Then a woman calls. Her name was Frances. She was part of the family who lost the largest number of people to Nat Turner. And what she did is that she said that when Nat Turner was captured, he had a sword and the Bible. So I said, I don't know if this is true. So we had her story, but then we did the research. The Bible was sent down from Massachusetts in 1818. The great Smithsonian scientists told the paper the age was right. And then they found a photograph of the Bible in 1872 of the frontispiece, and the water spots matched. So we knew we had the right Bible. So it's that kind of both luck, but also the skill of the Smithsonian that allowed us to tell these stories. So ultimately, we were able to find things, and for me, the most important material we found was remnants from a slave ship. And I had traveled the world trying to find a slave ship. I had done a lot of work in Cuba, but we couldn't cut a deal with the Castros. Then we were told that there was some work being done on a slave ship that left Lisbon, was chased by the British to Mozambique in 1794, went back to the New World and sank off the coast of Cape Town. We found it. We brought up things like these iron ballasts. But what's so amazing about it was I then went to Mozambique because there were 512 people from the Makua tribe on the ship. And I went to Mozambique and the chief of the Makua tribe said, I have a gift for you. He gave me this amazing vessel, a cowrie shell covered bowl. And he said, open it. And I opened it and it's full of dirt. And I'm trying to figure out exactly what this is. And then he said to me that his ancestors have pleaded that I take this soil, take it back to the site of the wreck in Cape Town and sprinkle it over the site of the wreck. So as he put it, for the first time since 1794, my people can sleep in their own land. For me, this is why we do the work that we do, to be able to do that. And it was really a horrible, stormy day when we actually went and put the soil back out. And on all things that's holy, as soon as the soil was sprinkled, the sun came out. Don't mess with ancestors. Taught me that very early. So ultimately, what this museum was really about was how do you craft exhibitions that take these artifacts that are dramatic, that really give you an understanding of the history. And the most important thing for us was, how do we figure out what stories we tell? Because we had nothing. So we spent two years interviewing people around the world. What did they know? What did they want to know? What should they know? And we married that with scholars. And what we realized is that we had to give people a narrative. So a third of the museum is really underground. And it really gives people a sense of slavery and freedom and gives people an understanding of the segregation era and really up to today. One of the things, okay, I wasn't going to stop talking about artifacts, but this is so amazing. This is a, a cabin for the enslaved 
from a plantation in South Carolina. But if you look carefully, you suddenly can see there are two doors. When the cabin was a, quote, slave cabin, there was only one way in and one way out. As soon as freedom came, they put a second door in. The notion of how do you make manifest freedom. For me, this cabin is one of the most powerful objects because it tells that story. And so, you know, we give people a sense of segregation and the role of African Americans in the military and also the kind of changing America of today, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. But we also want people to realize this is an educational entity. So one of the things we do, we have a whole floor that's just interactive education. This is a, an interactive that does the Green Book, that book that was used from the 30s to help African Americans figure out where they could stay, where they can eat. So you're literally going on a trip from Chicago to Alabama, and you gotta figure out where to stay. And so really trying ways to make this history accessible, or to give people a broader understanding of the role of sport, not just see how fast they ran, but sport as a means of social and racial liberation? Or how do we understand how regional variations shape who we are as a people? And obviously talking about the military experience as a way for African Americans to prove their worth. Or giving people an opportunity to grapple with the amazing cultural creativity of African Americans, but also help people understand how culture was a bulwark that help people survive. And there is Chuck Berry's candy apple red Cadillac for you. So I'll tell the story. I did not want that Cadillac. I called Chuck Berry and said, I want your guitar that you wrote Maybelline on. He said, I'm not gonna give you the guitar unless you take the car. I'm like, fine. Now, I don't want it, my staff is in love with it. And so, I send this young curator, his first job for me, to go out, Chuck Berry, the deal is done, have Chuck Berry sign the paperwork, and then ship the stuff back. And I said, if you get the guitar, do that first. That was really important to me. So he calls me saying, Chuck Berry's angry. Chuck Berry has decided he's not gonna give you anything. So I get on the phone with Chuck Berry, and Chuck Berry said, I just discovered you work for the federal government. I don't trust the federal government. I'm not gonna give you anything. So I said to him, what can we do? What can we do to make you trust us? He said, have your guy eat lunch with me. So I said to Kevin, that's your job, eat lunch with Chuck Berry. How hard can that be? Well, lunch for Chuck Berry was 25 ice cream sandwiches. He made Kevin eat 13. When Kevin ate the 13th, he signed the deed of gift. <laughs> and I thought the car was kind of throw in the car has become one of the most iconic images in the museum that people love. Um, the car and the mothership from George Clinton. Uh, I know, yeah, take it easy, I know the mothership. Um, but what struck me is I didn't know for sure we could find all this stuff. And that people's generosity, people's sense of how important this is, has really helped to create this museum um, as a place that matters for people. And we talk about everything from film and television and have fine arts gallery. But that's what hits me. Two months before we celebrated our anniversary, we had 2.8 million people. We're now up to 3.6 million people, visitors. Which means that we had expected 4,000 visitors a day, we're getting 8,000 visitors a day. And maybe the most telling notion is the dwell time, that people traditionally spend an hour and a half at the Smithsonian in a museum. I doubled it to three hours. People are spending five to seven hours in the museum. It's become that kind of pilgrimage place for intergenerational sharing, crossing racial lines. Um, and in some ways, we really wanted to make sure that we celebrated not the museum, but the fact that so many people cared. So Gladys Knight came and performed, and we did all kinds of community days. But in some ways, um, the most important thing I will leave you with is these voices of people who tell us what they do, what they think about the museum. We have sort of story core like booths through the museum, and we tape these, and I want to just let you hear a few if I can make it work. Okay, I guess I couldn't make it work. 
Can you show me how to make it work? Ah, that's my guy. Oh, okay, so now that my button's red, that's it? Yep. Hello, I'm Elijah Burkett, and I'm six years old. I'm Wendell Pritchett, and I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm Antonio, and I am from Washington, D.C. I'm Chiquita, and I'm from Newport News, Virginia. Bethina Woodridge, Oakland, California. From South America. I'm from Mira. Barbados. It's so overwhelming at first to see the history that had not been told. We're seeing the shackles of the children. It's just um, unimaginable to me. It really hit me hard. I had to do a lot of things to stop me from crying. It triggers your mind, it triggers your heart, it triggers past memories of your ancestors dating back so many years. The effects of slavery are still being felt today. The marches and the protests and the struggles, I've seen freedom, I've experienced segregation. And freedom to me is the right to choose who you want to love. Liberation. Peace. And being black, you can be beautiful as well. What else? Unity. So many stories to tell. Who we are as a people. Follow your heart. Know your culture. Never let us forget history, because history is the true teacher. We have nearly 10,000 of those that people have left us, so I did something wrong. Okay. My staff never lets me touch anything with technology. Um, but the bottom line is this. Let me close by talking about what this really means to us all. Not only has it become a place for intergenerational learning, not only has it become a place that crosses racial boundaries, but it really has become a gift to America. And in the time we're in now, it's become even more of a symbol and a metaphor of what is needed. And what I tell people all the time is that there's a line from one of the slave narratives from a man named Cor uh, Cornelius... Um, what is his name? Cornelius Holmes. And Cornelius Holmes was asked in 1939, does slavery still matter? And he said, well, you know, though the slavery question is answered, its impact is not. It is in our highways. It is in our schools. It is in our restaurants. It is in our churches. It is on our minds all the day, every day. I realize what the Smithsonian has done is... If we can help America understand that they are profoundly shaped by the African-American experience all the day, every day, what a gift we give. Thank you very much.